All right, so we're kind of here to talk about EKS, Kubernetes journey. As far as Kubernetes goes, about a year and a half ago, every single client I went to who adored my AWS experience said, hey, you know anything about Kubernetes? I'm like, I've heard of it, but nothing else. So after about six different colleagues brought up Kubernetes, 10 different clients, I'm like, I better figure out what this is. So probably the last year and a half, I have been all Kubernetes, it's all I do. I really, really like it. And I was there day one when EKS went to GA and was think this is gonna be the greatest thing ever. And not 100% correct. So that's kind of my background story. You can tell everybody what yours is. Yeah, I'm Corey Twitty. Um, I've been working with Kubernetes for about three years now. Um, I've deployed it multiple clusters to bare metal. Um, I've used managed services like EKS. Um, so I've, I've had quite a bit of experience deploying Kubernetes a bunch of different ways to the cloud, on-prem. Um, so yeah. So I'm gonna talk about the good, because I'm the AWS guy. I love AWS, I love EKS. There are some very good parts of it. Uh, first thing I have on the slide is managed control plane. What does that mean? For those of you that have done Kubernetes, essentially the managed control plane is the Kubernetes master. So Amazon takes care of your master, your etcd, API server, what else? What other part am I missing? Con yeah, cloud controller manager, all of that. They run that, they scale it, they du duplicate it across regions, make it where it's pretty much bulletproof. I mean, it, it just works. Uh, the other thing we found is ease of cluster deployment. So when I first started with Kubernetes, I was looking through Kubernetes the hard way. I looked through some other books really to learn how to do it. Finally found some stuff. Worked through the process of deploying it just onto EC2 instances. Went through, okay, I got the master up, but I can't talk to my worker nodes. Got everything kind of working and still like DNS wouldn't work. I know you kind of went through a similar thing when you were trying to build Kubernetes the first time. Yeah, so like the first time I tried to build Kubernetes, I tried to do it all from scratch. Uh, I actually wrote a chef a cookbook to try to do it. Um, it was very difficult trying to read through all the documentation and not understanding anything about microservices. Barely even understood what uh, containers were. It, it probably took me over three months when I initially started to try to get a Kubernetes cluster deployed and actually understand each of the components of Kubernetes. Um, so yeah. So I came in, EC2, put Kubernetes on it, got it installed and running. I would say it took me like two, three weeks to try and get it up, but a lot better documentation, probably a full year or two after you went through the mess. And it was easy, and then all of a sudden EKS came out. I'm like, this is gonna be the greatest thing ever. So I started on my EKS journey. It took me, I would bet two, maybe another three weeks to geek, get EKS up and running because the documentation wasn't quite on par. Some of the stuff they said, totally wrong. You had to figure it out on your own. You know, build the VPCs differently than the client wanted some of the stuff all private. Some could be public, so you had to completely change how EKS got deployed to make that work. But I still was able to get it way faster than the struggle you had, way faster than anybody that's going through like Kubernetes the hard way, or even back when the documentation was terrible and trying to get Kubernetes set up. You take this managed service, you've got EKS running in your Amazon environment, everything available that AWS does. Um, so the other part of it, next little point, is reduced upgrade complexity. This part is really good, so if you know, you get some sort of security vulnerability comes out. Amazon is right there. They're gonna upgrade your EKS. You're gonna master, it's gonna be completely secure and you're gonna be fine, ready to roll. <laughs> so there, there is 
w one problem with this though is they will manage and update the control plane, but the data plane workers, you still have to update on your own. So they will, so, so like the last set of CVEs that went out for Kubernetes, they, they patched the control plane within about a day, but the data planes were still on us to patch roll out the updates on. Yeah, that's definitely was the biggest eye opener when I got EKS. I'm like, all right, I don't have to do anything. I don't need to know any more about Kubernetes. I'm done with the master. Every single worker node is 100% on you. You better know every bit of Kubernetes to be able to build that because all they do is the master and the little worker nodes, which is basically all of Kubernetes, is all on you still. So kind of buyer beware. Don't think this solves all your problems. Yes, that are unencrypted that are completely bare bones. You have to go in there and do anything you need to. But yes, they do provide it. <laughs> yes, there, there is a nice AMI they provide. You have to do everything else to make it work with inside, in your security. As any company, you have to meet the security demands of it. They are always well beyond what AMI that Amazon provides as a public AMI. So you gotta kinda run your own. Uh, the other good part, all your existing AWS services kind of plug into it. So your IAM, your VPC, all your networking and everything. So if you're already all in in AWS, I hope you all are, because it's great. And everything kind of works. That's the good part. So one, one really telling part was a colleague of mine, JP, was talking about EKS. And his words to me, I really have nothing to say about EKS. It's just there. And that was profound because it really is that. It just works, it sits there, it does what it needs to do, and as a developer, you don't even think about it. There isn't a thought given to the master, a thought given to any of the other parts of it working. Everything is just there. But once you get to an advanced level and you really want to know your Kubernetes and know what's going on, that leads to slide number two, the bad and the ugly. Yeah, so some of the things we noticed when we were running our managed uh, Kubernetes service, like EKS, um, one of the first one was, since it was a managed service, we didn't have a much, as much flexibility in what feature gates we were allowed to enable, because all that is on the API server, which you don't have access to. So, like one example was, we run a lot of jobs in our Kubernetes clusters, and those jobs in the older versions of Kubernetes, there was no feature to clean up completed jobs, so they would persist forever. And we would have like thousands of jobs just sitting like completed. Uh, so we ended up having to create a cron job to go in there and clean up the completed jobs. Um, but with 1.14, I believe, they released a feature set that would set a TTL on completed jobs and clean them up. But that is an alpha, and we can't enable it in our EKS clusters. Um, and another thing is some of the standard emission controllers, such as pod security policies, we currently cannot enable within our EKS clusters because it does not support anything outside of the couple of emission controllers they already have set up. Um, so I, I, another issue is like vendor lock-in and hidden costs. So um, until about a couple of weeks ago, um, there were no control plane logs, no audit logs for Kubernetes. It wasn't, uh, they, they had no support for it. So, uh, so a couple of weeks ago they released that, but they released that as CloudWatch logs in CloudTrail. So the problem is if you have your own managed Elasticsearch or an Elasticsearch cluster or some other place that you ship logs to, now you have additional costs that you have to then stream the logs from CloudWatch into your log uh, platform. And like, we know from experience that, that we have been hit with pretty high costs on that. Like, a, yeah, so that's something that we definitely have to watch out for. Um. Yeah, it's definitely an issue where the ability to even see what your master is doing, the logs, it took them a year to expose that in EKS. And so the entire time we had 
colleagues at the last place, he's like, well, how do I know what's going on? How do I look at this? And there's nothing, it's just a black box. And finally, it's probably been the last couple of weeks, we've finally gotten the ability to look at logs. But the, the real struggle is the update velocity. So you've got Kubernetes, which is this massively popular open source project that is moving as fast as anything you've ever seen. And Amazon, this huge behemoth, is trying to keep up with it, and it's almost hysterical. At one point, our documentation fell off of what was even supported by EKS or by Kubernetes. So you just you keep falling behind the curve, and there's almost no way for Amazon to keep up. I have talked to everybody at Amazon in Dallas, and they're like trying to work on it, and they get real proud when they're only two versions behind. So it's like, um, we need you to be like up to date within like a couple weeks. And I just don't know if they can scale at that speed. I don't know if it's possible to match, you know, an open source project that has really high velocity with something like Amazon that just cannot match that velocity of bringing out upgrades. Yeah, and then for the last point, unmanaged data plane. So I think anyone who has spent any amount of time managing a Kubernetes cluster uh, notices that like the data plane is one of the most difficult parts of Kubernetes to manage. Man like scheduling pods, uh, taking care of node groups, um, all of that. And EKS, while it gives you the managed control plane for your masters, it really doesn't do a lot for the data plane. Um, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, the worker nodes, you have to do everything. It is a profound challenge. So if you're coming from an existing Kubernetes environment, and you've got a team that's either got Kubernetes on bare metal or Kubernetes on just EC2 instances, for them to switch into e EKS, it really alters their entire troubleshooting and workflow system. They don't have the ability to go into the master to really get in there and do some of the troubleshooting that they've done where they just go into the master, look at what's going on, look at the logs, oh, this is the process for solving it. Everything has to be done through kubectl. Everything has to be done this entirely different way. So you've got these highly trained engineers that you've spent all this time teaching them, hey, this is how we do it on REC2. Let's move to EKS because everything will be solved and it'll just be happy. It's not. It's going to be, it has good places, it has bad places. Really, what would be like some teams that would be good for EKS? Yeah, so some teams I think would be good fit for EKS would be teams that are mostly developer focused, uh, don't have a lot of experience handling infrastructure, uh, or teams that uh, need something quick to, to get deployed quickly uh, as like kind of like a stopgap before they look at running their own Kubernetes cluster. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I worked with a couple guys at Verizon and they were talking, you know, they decided to basically build their own Kubernetes, build it from the ground up. And one of the critical things they said is like, that's the only way we learned it. If we hadn't implemented it that way, we wouldn't understand what our Kubernetes is doing. And really what they suggested, which surprised me, EKS would be a good point to go after you already know how to do Kubernetes really well. And where you know, okay, this is how everything works, now let's let them manage it and take some of that headache off of us, free us up to do some other things. But they said by that time, they had everything pretty much perfected on their master and put zero effort into managing it at that point. And they could scale as far as they needed to. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything that we wanted to cover about EKS, just some of the warnings, some of the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, we're gonna be up in where the Open Space Suite 4, Suite 923. I don't know if this time is right, but yeah, come by and talk to us. We know EKS, we know Kubernetes. If you're having thoughts about moving to there, are there, we'd love to talk to you. But thanks for coming to our talk.